Well, um, I don't really need to read another text because I've, I've actually given us one. But again, remembering what we're looking at is the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And as I said before, as we, as we finally, uh, let's say, establish this um, commandment as continuing, then we're, we're going to find that everything we need to do is really wrapped up in those few words. It contains everything we're supposed to do. And we just need to unpack it a little bit to see what it means. And we'll do that uh, beginning next week, I think. But uh, anyway, with regard to what we've seen so far this morning, remember we were looking at New Testament evidences, passages, arguments that the Sabbath continues into the New Covenant. Uh, just briefly, let me just remind you of what they are. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount that the moral law, the Ten Commandments, can, will continue. I mean, it continues and will continue to be God's standard until His plan for this present heavens and earth are fulfilled. So, um, until heaven and earth pass away, not one single letter or stroke of the law will pass away until all is accomplished, all in the law and the prophets, all that is a part of God's plan. We saw, secondly, that Jesus declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath, and he tells us how we are to observe it and also how not to observe it. Uh, and that's a part of the new covenant instruction that Jesus was giving his, to his disciples, which he says, take to the nations. And when you disciple them, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. He told his disciples that they were to pray that when 70 AD comes and God's judgment upon Jerusalem, upon the Jews for rejecting Jesus, they were to pray that, that the day in which they would have to get out of Jerusalem would not take place on the Sabbath which would be strange if, again, the, the church was not keeping the Sabbath, what difference would it make? Okay, the Sabbath would still be in place for the church. And we saw how the author to the Hebrews, far from telling us that Jesus had done away with the Sabbath because of his work, actually argues that it continues because of what he has done. Now, um, let me just read this, uh, Hebrews, 4, ver uh, Hebrews 4, verses 9 and 10, uh, in, in the way that I think it, it should be read. You know, the word, so, sometimes it's, it's translated in a way that's not helpful, but let me just put it, a couple of, of changes. Therefore, and this is something we find in the King James, it's certainly an option in the language instead of so. Therefore, there remains a Sabbath day. That's what the word Sabbath rest means. Remember Sabbatismos, which is the keeping of a day of rest. Therefore, there remains a Sabbath day for the people of God. Uh, and that's post-Christ and his work. You know, he's already died, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven. The author to the Hebrews is saying there remains this Sabbath day of rest for Christians for or because... The one who has entered his rest, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, on that first day of the week, has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. And one thing we saw about the way God rests from his works is he looked back at all he had done for those six days and he said, it is good. Okay? Now Jesus is the only other person who could actually look back at his works and say the same thing. And then we also saw the greater grace which is given to us in the new covenant binds our hearts even more to worship God, right? I mean, if we were bound to worship him from creation, bound to worship him from the grace shown in the, in the old covenant, how much more in the new covenant? And remember that worship takes time, time that needs to be the same for all of us so that we can do what the author to the Hebrews tells us to do, which is not forsake the assembling of ourselves, the gathering of ourselves together for worship and for encouragement. Now, those, that's just a brief summary of what we saw this morning. Let's, this evening, consider four objections raised against a continuing Sabbath. Okay? Now, the first objection is, and again, this is of the objector, in the New Covenant, we no longer need to keep the Ten Commandments. Now, are there people who believe that? You know, well, yes, there are. There's whole movements, whole churches uh, that do. The college that I went to, that was their position. Um, the idea is, 
that, um, as, as my um, uh, Greek professor said, who also was, I think, uh, a professor of systematic theology, professor of missions, he was the academic dean, he also was the president of the seminary across the street. This guy is incredible, just incredible energy and zeal for the Lord. But the one thing he lacked was really a clear understanding of, of what the Bible teaches in some areas. Okay? And one of the points of confusion was this, because this is what he told me. He says, just as when you're in Mexico, you're under the law of Mexico, as, and when you're in the U.S., you're under the law of the U.S., so when you're in the Old Covenant, you're under the law of the Old Covenant, which is the Ten Commandments. But in the New Covenant, you're no longer under the law of the Old Covenant because the Ten Commandments was Old Covenant law. So basically, that, that was his argument. And then another fellow student whose argument was this, and again, reflecting the idea of the college, we're not under the, the, the Ten Commandments in the New Covenant. We're under what is called the law of, of love. Now, in answer to that, we've already seen the answer to the objection that the Ten Commandments don't continue. Jesus doesn't treat the Old Covenant moral law as something that is only for the Old Covenant. Okay? He tells us, as I've already mentioned, that as long as the heavens and the earth endure, the moral law remains the standard, and that is the Ten Commandments. But here's another answer to this objection. You know, we're not under the Ten Commandments, we're under the law of love. But what is the law of love? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, what it is. He says, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Oh, there you go, the law of love. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Well, what law is that? Well, for this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So what is the law of love? The law of love is the Ten Commandments. It's what God gives to us to show us how to love him and our neighbor. You know, Jesus was essentially saying the same thing to the scribe who asked him, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said this in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Okay? So yes, he's right. The, the commandment, as it were, in the new covenant is the law of love, but the law of love is, is unpacked by the Ten Commandments. We can't pit the two against each other because they are really the same thing. So that answers the first objection. We don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. We do, okay? Jesus tells us we do. That's what it means to love. That's what it means to be like Him. Now, the second objection is that the commandments continue except for the Sabbath, okay? Remember that we saw that uh, John MacArthur said that the Sabbath is the only commandment among the Ten Commandments that is not a moral commandment, and because it's not moral, it's basically been done away with. Okay? Let me, again, read that quote that I read on the first sermon that we were dealing with the subject. Quote, There is no question about the other nine commandments being permanent and binding. We are to have no other gods. We are never to make an idol. We are to worship only the true and living God. We are never to take the name of the Lord in vain. We are not to dishonor our father or mother, but rather give them honor. We are not to murder, commit adultery, steal, lie, or covet. Those are all moral mandates, moral commands, with the exception of verses 8 through 11, the fourth command regarding the Sabbath. Now, I mentioned before that um, the problem with this is it takes away when we're supposed to worship, you know. Uh, the, the commandment tells us, you know, the commandment tells us who we're supposed to worship, how we're supposed to worship Him, but it doesn't tell us when unless we have the fourth commandment, which tells us how often and how long. 
But again, consider what we saw this morning, what I just reviewed at the beginning, all these arguments, how Jesus tells us that it continues, okay? How he is the Lord of the Sabbath, how the disciples will be observing the Sabbath in the future, how the author to the Hebrews says that the Sabbath remains for the people of God. Consider also what we just saw under point one, how the Sabbath is a part of the law of love that God has given to his people. And then also consider what I just said, that, that is without the fourth commandment, we have no direction at all on when we are to worship the Lord or how often we are to worship him. And that worship is a moral obligation. That's not something we can just dismiss. Without that fourth commandment, yes, we are to worship God, but when? Okay, well, this gives us the when. Now, one further thing that I hadn't mentioned before is simply this, and I think this is the way we need to understand how the Old Testament and New Testament relate, because the question always comes up, how do we know when God institutes something in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, how do we know when that is no longer binding on us, okay? For the dispensationalists, often, not, not for all of them, but you know, some of them, it, it's kind of like the Old Testament, you just kind of take it and remove it, and all we have is the New Testament, and some would even shave that down a little bit further and take away the Gospels because Jesus was speaking to the Jews and leave us with Luke and Paul and you know, writings that are specifically for the Gentiles. So that's one way of, of dealing with the issue. You just, nothing you know, from the Old Covenant, we start completely new. But there are others who say, and I think this is right, that if God says to do something, then you keep doing it until he says, stop doing that, okay? So in other words, the Lord has clearly, has to clearly abrogate a particular commandment uh, before we stop doing it. Now we see in the new covenant that Jesus in his ministry corrected the Jewish misunderstanding of the Sabbath, but he never abrogated the Sabbath. And so it remains in force. Okay, now let's get into those couple of verses that I was talking about where we want to spend the majority of our time. The third objection is the Sabbath is only a shadow. The reality is Christ. And now that he has come, the shadows have passed away. This argument basically, you know, and the next are most often used against the Sabbath. And they both have one thing in common, I think. And that is that they're both referring or saying that the Sabbath is a part of the ceremonial law, and now the ceremonial law has been abrogated, we no longer have to keep the Sabbath. Now, this argument is based, first of all, on what Paul says, what he writes in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17, which we read for our meditation. Let me read it again. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now their argument is simply this, now that the reality has come in Christ, the shadows have passed away. And as I've said, another way of looking at this is simply this, the things that Paul lists here are all a part of the ceremonial law. The Sabbath is included in this list. Since the ceremonial law has been fulfilled by Christ and is no longer binding, the Sabbath also is no longer binding. Now, we have to answer this, don't we? Because this, this is, I think, a valid objection. What does this verse mean? Does it say the Sabbath is no longer binding? Does it go against everything we've, just, you know, so we've already seen regarding the Sabbath? Well, first of all, we need to remember that the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, was ordained at the creation, okay? We saw God created in six days, and he rested on the seventh, and he blessed that day for mankind. The point here is he established it before the ceremonial law. It can't be a part of the ceremonial law if it was established before the ceremonial law even existed. Okay, so that's the first objection, the first answer to the objection. Secondly, and perhaps more clearly, the word Sabbath in this passage is in the plural, okay? Now, in the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, it's singular, the Sabbath. There is the weekly Sabbath, 
the permanent moral commandment written on stone. Remember, remember the other argument that we saw, which is there are these commandments that are written on stone, and then there were these commandments that were written in a book that was placed next to the ark that contained the two tablets of stone. We have a clear separation between these two different kinds of laws. Those in the ark on the stone are the moral commandments, and those are the ones that are permanent, shown by the fact they're written on stone. Those that are written in the book were all the ceremonial laws, which Jesus came into the world to fulfill, and, and those have passed away. Now, um, okay, so in this case, there is the moral commandment written on stone, but there are also other Sabbaths. And here's the thing we need to understand. There are other Sabbaths called Sabbaths that are connected to the ceremonial feast days. So what I'm trying to say is there's a distinction between the weekly Sabbath written on stone, the ceremonial Sabbaths written in the book put next to the ark, okay? Now, let me give you a couple of examples of that. First of all, the Day of Atonement was called a Sabbath. Moses writes in Leviticus 23, verses 27 and following, on exactly the 10th day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to the Lord. You shall not do any work on this same day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God. It is to be a Sabbath of complete rest to you, and you shall humble your souls. Now, what he's saying is the day of atonement was a Sabbath. Okay? It's one of the, the feasts, a very important sacrifice made on this day. Now, the question is, did that day always fall on the seventh day of the week? Did it always fall on the weekly Sabbath? The answer to that question is no, it didn't. It could fall on any day of the week, but it was also a Sabbath, okay? So here's one Sabbath connected to the ceremonial law. There were another two Sabbaths that were connected to the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, the, to remind the Israelites that they wandered in tents until the Lord brought them into the land, Leviticus 23, 39. On exactly the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the crops of your land, you shall celebrate the Feast of the Lord for seven days with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. Now John Owen goes as well actually gives us a little bit more insight into this and he says that every rest day that was connected to a feast day and every feast was actually called a, uh, excuse me, a Sabbath by <clears throat> the Jews. Let me give you a quote from John Owen. He's not the easiest to understand so I will try to um, again read this in a way that hopefully is understandable. This, this isn't one of his more difficult passages. But he says this, quote, It is known and confessed that at that time all Judaical observation of days, by the way, this is addressing uh, in his Hebrews commentary, he's talking about the Hebrews 4 passage and, and making a distinction between ceremonial Sabbaths and the Sabbath day. But he says, It is known and confessed that at that time all Judaical observation of days of the days which they religiously observed, whether feasts or fasts, weekly, monthly, or annual, were by themselves and all others called their Sabbaths. And that kind of speech, which was then in common use, is here used by our apostle. It must therefore necessarily be allowed that there were two sorts of Sabbaths among them. The first in principle was the weekly Sabbath, so called from the rest of God upon the finishing of his works. This being designed for sacred and religious uses. Other days separated unto the same ends in general came from their analogy to these Sabbaths, to, or to the Sabbath, to be called Sabbaths. Also, yes, were so called by God himself as has been declared, and as I just gave you a couple of examples. But the distinction and difference between these Sabbaths was great. The one of them was ordained from the foundation of the world, before the entrance of sin, or giving of the promises, and so belonged unto all mankind in general. The others were appointed in the wilderness as a part of the peculiar church worship of the Israelites, and so belonged unto them only. The one of them was, directed, was directly commanded in the Decalogue, 
wherein the law of our creation was revived and expressed. The others have their institution expressly among the residue of ceremonial temporary ordinances. Now I realize that's, that's a mouthful, but it essentially was saying the same thing that I've just said. There's two kinds of Sabbaths, okay? There is the weekly Sabbath. It's a part of the Ten Commandments written on stone. And then there are those Sabbaths that are connected to the ceremonial law. Now, what Paul is arguing in our passage when he talks about food and drink, distinctions of which have been you know, done away with in the new covenant. Remember the sheet lowered from heaven that, and the voice that came to Peter, arise, Peter, slay and eat. Uh, that um, distinction of foods and so forth was, was a part of the ceremonial law, the separation laws that kept Israel separate. Uh, Paul also talks about in our passage the idea of these, um, what does he say, the uh, festivals and the new moons and so forth. These are all part of the ceremonial law. And so should we expect the Sabbaths that he's referring to here as well to be the ceremonial Sabbaths, which were a part of the ceremonial law, which has been fulfilled by Christ and is no longer binding, so no longer needs to be kept, what he's telling the Colossians is that this group of people who are troubling you, saying that these are the things you need to keep, you don't need to keep those. Okay? That's a part of the ceremonial law. That may or may not be done according to what really you choose to do. It's a matter of Christian liberty. But he's not arguing here for the abrogation of the weekly Sabbath. Now, the last objection comes from Romans 14, verse 5 where Paul appears to be saying that we have the freedom in the new covenant either to keep or not keep the Sabbath or, you know, to have one day a special day or have no days a special day. He writes this, One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. Okay, sounds like, hey, no distinction in days. You can do what you want to do. It doesn't matter. If you keep a Sabbath if you want to, you don't have to keep a Sabbath if you don't want to. But again, let's remember everything we've already seen, okay? Paul can't mean that here, okay? He also can't mean that there's absolutely no distinction between days of any kind. If that were the case, then we have to ask ourselves the question, what is John referring to when he writes in Revelation 1 verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, I want you to see here that John is talking about a particular day. He's making a distinction here. And I realize that there are those, and particularly dispensationalists, I hate to always use them as kind of the brunt of, of the, uh, the argument, but dispensationalists often see that passage referring to the day of God's judgment because that's what the day of the Lord is. The term, the day of the Lord, is used throughout the Bible in many different contexts, and it always refers to a judgment that God is bringing. But that's not what John is talking about here. He's not talking about the day of the Lord. He's talking about the Lord's day. Now, there are only two contexts in which John, or I should say, let's see, is it John in both cases? Not sure that it is, but... Only two contexts in which this pronoun, Lord's, which means belonging to the Lord, is used in the Bible. One of them refers to the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, right? The other one refers to the Lord's Day. And what it means is here are two things that belong to the Lord, that belong to Christ, okay? John Murray argues that the Lord has left us with two memorials that bring to our remembrance the two main events by which we are saved, those two being Jesus' death and His resurrection. His death is, again, brought to our remembrance through the Lord's Supper. His resurrection is, uh, we're reminded of it every Lord's Day, because the Lord's Day is the day of His resurrection. By the way, let me just say as an aside, this is one of the reasons why we celebrate a weekly communion so that every Lord's Day we can remember not only His resurrection, but also His death. Now, since the Lord has clearly set this day aside to be His day, 
Paul can't mean here that there's no distinction between days or that we can disregard that day if we so choose to do. So what he is saying is the same thing he said to the Colossians. Jesus has fulfilled the ceremonial law, including its special days and Sabbaths. And since they're no longer binding, a believer may or may not observe those days according to what they really would like to do in the same way that a Jew could continue to observe any of the Jewish customs that they wanted to as long as they didn't rely on those things to make them right with God, as long as they didn't depend on those things for their justification. Um, remember, we, we see examples of this throughout the Bible. The Jerusalem Council was challenged with the idea from the Judaizers, remember, that for Gentiles to be saved, they had to be circumcised and they had to observe the law of Moses. Well, then Peter gets up and he argues, why would we place on the yoke or on the necks of the disciples a yoke which neither we nor our forefathers could bear? He was talking about the ceremonial law. He was talking about the Jewish traditions. So they came to this conclusion that the Gentiles don't have to keep the traditions, okay? But because they live around Jews who might be offended by certain things, they gave them four things they were to observe so that they wouldn't offend the Jewish brethren and they wouldn't offend the Jews who weren't brethren. And those things all had to do with the ceremonial law. So basically, don't use your liberty to offend your brethren. You know, uh, Paul was doing exactly the same thing. He, after telling the Galatians, if you're circumcised, according to what the Judaizers are teaching you, if you're circumcised and you're, you're depending on that and you're keeping of the law of Moses to be justified, you've fallen away from Christ. And then we see Paul taking Timothy and having him circumcised uh, to take him along with him so that he won't offend any of the Jews who knew that, that his father was a Greek and his mother was, was Jewish. So Paul says, don't circumcise, and then Paul circumcises Timothy. So how do we make sense of that? Well, of course, he was telling the Galatians, if you're circumcised in order to make yourself right with God, you're doing some kind of a work. You've fallen away from Christ and his grace. But if you are keeping the Jewish tradition as a matter of, of liberty in order to promote the gospel and not relying on it to be saved, well, that's perfectly all right. You know that Paul himself paid the expenses for four Jewish believers to fulfill their vows uh, and to show the Jews in Jerusalem that, you know, this is the counsel James gave him, show the Jews in Jerusalem that you keep the law and you're walking according to the traditions that were handed down to us by Moses, pay for these four men and go in with them and go through the ceremonial rituals and cleansings with them and they'll know there's nothing to what they've heard uh, from other Jews about you that you've abandoned Moses. So basically, Paul was keeping the traditions. He was keeping these things that one may keep or not keep according to what their particular desire was. And I believe that um, that is really what he is addressing in that passage. The ceremonial Sabbaths could be kept, or they don't have to be kept. It's a part of the ceremonial law. It just depends on what you would like to do. The choice, of course, should be shaped by whether or not what we do is going to help or hinder uh, the gospel. But the weekly Sabbath, remember, on the other hand, was never optional it is perpetually binding on us. It is a moral commandment. You know, again, we've seen the reasons why we believe that. Well, okay, those are the main objections and those are the answers to the objections. Again, we all need to consider what we've heard and determine whether or not that is, in fact, what God is telling us in His Word. And again, as we draw our conclusion, let me, let me just, again, remind all of us, we, we do make our decisions based on a couple of different things. Okay, there are those people, and this should be all of us, who make our, our, you know, our conclusions, base our conclusions on what the Bible actually says. And then there's another group of people who make their decisions based upon what they want the Bible to say, okay? And we have to be careful that we don't do that.
And let's not forget that, that God gave us the Sabbath to be a blessing to us. You know, it, it actually is very good to be able to rest a day and to spend that day with the Lord because that's what builds us up in Christ. It's good. And we should never look at it as anything bad. And oftentimes, you know, there are those believers who do, and it weights them against it. And, or they might have something else riding on it, like uh, maybe they have a business and the business is open on Sunday. You know, that, that can be pretty compelling to make you want to steer away from the idea that, no, oh, we shouldn't be doing any work on the Sabbath. My servants shouldn't be doing any work on the Sabbath. I shouldn't be causing anybody to work on, on the Sabbath. So we have to be careful that our internal desires don't get in the way of what the Bible actually tells us, what God says in His Word. Now, next week, um, we're going to look at why the New Testament believers began to observe the first day of the week as the Sabbath rather than the seventh day. I think I told you in a recent conversation I had, somebody accused me of being a legalist because we were talking about the Sabbath. And he said, if, if you say that, that you know, the, the Sabbath should be observed on the first day of the week when the commandment itself says that it's on the seventh day of the week, well, you've, you're a legalist because you've changed the law. You know, and I, I said, well, no, I didn't change it. God changed it. You know, it, it changed when Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And that is, is really, we'll get back into Hebrews 4 again for that, but that is the argument the author to the Hebrews is actually making. So we're going to want to look at why we believe it's on the first day of the week rather than on the seventh day of the week. And then we'll also begin looking at how we are to keep the Sabbath day holy. Well, let's, um, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father,